the Atlantic surf breaks on the shore of the biggest rocket launching site in the world. This is the Kennedy Space Center. From here, the human race reached the moon. Today, the sprawling city of sophisticated technology is the launch site for the American Space Shuttle. It's the last place that one would expect to find wildlife, but it thrives here undisturbed. Nowhere else on Earth is there such an extraordinary juxtaposition of nature and high technology. Where the human race reaches for the stars, there is a unique space for wildlife. and we have liftoff. exploration of space has given us a new perspective on our fragile planet and the thin film of air and water on its surface without which there would be no life. North America shows up through a break in the cloud cover. The eastern side is in twilight. The Kennedy Space Center is halfway down the Florida Peninsula on a barrier island jutting out into the Atlantic near Cape Canaveral. The central focus of the sprawl of launch pads and runways is the massive Space Vehicle Assembly Building. It is one of the largest buildings in the world by volume. Each star on the flag is two meters high. Cape Canaveral has been a rocket launching site since World War II. Some of the first long-range missiles were tested from the Air Force pads here, where they could be fired more safely out to sea. 
The early space launches took place from the Cape itself, but in 1961, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, or NASA, decided that more extensive facilities were needed. The land just behind and to the north of the Cape was selected. This marshy wilderness is called Merritt Island. It's 70,000 hectares of subtropical pine and palm with tidal swamps, great stands of mangroves and freshwater lagoons. Merritt Island lies on the boundary between the temperate regions and the tropics, and it attracts a great range of species from both. These roseate spoonbills are tropical. Right from the start, the importance of wildlife was recognized by NASA, and they invited the US Fish and Wildlife Service to help them manage the non-operational areas. The impact on wildlife was considered at every stage, and so the Space Center has now become one of the most important natural refuges in Florida. It's a paradise for up to a thousand eastern brown pelicans. There are hundreds of thousands of water birds here, and in winter many migrants escaping the cold further north. They all find it a peaceful haven, except perhaps when technology takes over. The Space Shuttle Orbiter is flown in from California on top of a Boeing 747. It will be prepared for launch in the Vehicle Assembly Building, or VAB for short. The VAB dominates the Space Center landscape. It's over 150 meters tall. Perhaps it's appropriate that it's surrounded by some of the largest and most dominant members of the wildlife community. Alligators have been protected from hunters on Merritt Island since NASA arrived, and they've been growing ever since. The majority are now over three meters long. In parts of the spaceport near the visitor's centers, the alligators have done rather too well. They've lost their fear of humans. This is one of the many areas where the US Fish and Wildlife Service have to keep a close watch on developments, removing the nuisance alligators if necessary. With so many of Florida's marshes and swamps being reclaimed for housing developments, alligators are disappearing but the Space Center has at least 5,000. The alligators can wait for prey for days in the steamy mangrove swamps. Raccoons like mangrove swamps too. They do well in marginal habitats in almost all areas of the spaceport, and there's been a large increase in their population. The raccoons are very partial to the blue crabs in the mangroves. An experienced raccoon will usually chew off the biting parts of the crab before they bite it. Raccoons learn by trial and error.
Raccoons are good swimmers, but there's a time and a place for everything. There's competition for the prey. Alligators are not gentle with each other. The smaller of the two, a three meter specimen, backs off. The raccoon population can sustain considerable predation. Alligators are a threatened species in Florida, while raccoons are very numerous, some would say too numerous. The vehicle assembly building is the focus for the next stage of the shuttle mission. Inside, the 99-ton shuttle orbiter is being raised into a vertical position. On the second shuttle mission, the orbiter was flown by astronauts Engel and Truly, and the symbol for the mission was the bald eagle. This was appropriate, for bald eagles live right in the heart of the space center. They rear their young as little as two kilometers from the VAB. The Space Center is excellent eagle country. It has tall trees for nesting and shallow fishing waters close at hand. hundred years ago, there were thousands of bald eagles nesting and fishing in Florida. It was one of the densest breeding populations of eagles known in the world. Now, after years of persecution and pesticides, there are only 300 breeding pairs in the state. The future doesn't look too good either. On the east coast of Florida, eagle nesting habitat is being destroyed at an alarming rate by building development. In the years to come, it's conceivable that the spaceport might be the last kingdom of these lordly birds. Today, the protection here ensures a sanctuary for six pairs to rear their young. Southern bald eagles migrate north for the summer. The parents go first, followed by the young. With luck, these eaglets raised at the space center will come back and establish territories here. All the shuttle components are brought to the VAB for assembly. A ship canal has been dug so that the heavier shuttle components can be transported to the VAB by barge. The external rocket fuel tank is shipped from the factory in Louisiana. The system works fine for NASA, but for one group of animals, it was potentially very hazardous. These aquatic mammals moved in after the canal had been dug and found it very much to their liking. But the barge traffic put their lives at considerable risk. The main danger was from the ship's propellers. They're Caribbean manatees a rare and critically endangered species. Mm. 
Manatees weigh up to half a ton and cannot move fast. This mother is suckling her calf in the middle of the ship canal. As many as 250 manatees, a quarter of the United States population, may be in the space center at one time. In the early days, one or two manatees were killed by ships. NASA immediately consulted the Fish and Wildlife Service to prevent further accidents. Today, barge crews are trained to spot manatees and to travel slowly enough to allow them to get out of the way. One of the manatees bears mute testimony as to what happens when they venture outside the space center. The scars are the marks of an ordinary powerboat propeller that is cut into its back. It's one of the lucky ones. Florida's one million powerboats kill and mangle scores of these gentle giants each year. The manatees aren't the only endangered species to have benefited from the barge canals. The eastern brown pelican makes a good living here too. The brown pelican holds a special place in American conservationists' hearts because it was to save them from slaughter by fishermen in Florida that the first national wildlife refuge of all was set up nearby in 1903. The external fuel tank is unloaded under the watchful eye of the harbour master. The brown pelican dives for fish, which it scoops up in the large expanding pouch under its beak. Inside the vehicle assembly building, the shuttle orbiter is now upright and its black nose is being bolted onto the massive external tank which it will ride into space. The tank provides the orbiter with its liquid hydrogen and oxygen fuel. All this technical wizardry is of no concern to the wildlife outside. It's more interested in fishing the lagoons of the space center. The water levels are controlled in a series of impoundments by the fish and wildlife rangers. Originally, this was to prevent mosquitoes breeding, but now it's also part of a larger management plan. A series of dams and sluices allows the rangers to drain the lagoons and marshes and then to fill them with either fresh or salt water. In this way, they maintain an optimum variety of conditions for waders and fishing birds. One small sluice can affect thousands of hectares of water. When an impoundment is drained down, black skimmers come flocking in to reap the fish harvest. Black skimmers are one of the Space Center's most remarkable fishing birds. They skim over the water with their lower mandible just below the surface. When it strikes a fish, the top mandible will snap down on it immediately, and the fish is caught without any hesitation in flight. Their flying skills have been the envy of astronauts who have watched them here. The lagoons and impoundments are some of the most prolific areas in the world. 
For the birds, there are 117 species of fish to choose from, as well as clams and crabs. Looking at these controlled brackish water impoundments, it's easy to forget that the roaring Atlantic surf is only a kilometre away. The public have access to the beach within 10 kilometres of the centre, but then a security fence clearly spells out the message. It may look insubstantial, but it's backed up by some of the most sophisticated radar detection and electronic surveillance. Nevertheless, the security doesn't stop wildlife getting through. The owner of the tracks is a member of the large raccoon population. Raccoons will wander at will on both sides of the fence. This one sniffs around in the hope of finding the remains of someone's picnic. But the raccoons will find more food on the spaceport side of the fence after sunset. The shuttle program is on the go both day and night, and so is the wildlife. After sunset, a new cast of characters will appear on the Space Center's beaches. As the shuttle rolls out in preparation for launch at the Kennedy Space Center, a creature that evolved in prehistoric times hauls itself up the sand to lay its eggs on the beach near the launch pad. It's a 120 kilo loggerhead turtle. The loggerhead turtle comes out of the ocean to lay her eggs in a pit which she excavates above the high tide mark. She carefully covers her eggs. Turtles were nesting in this way 200 million years before the space age. The Space Center's high security beaches are very important to nesting turtles, as Dr. Lou Earhart of the University of Central Florida has discovered. When he began work here, he thought that the lights on the shuttle at night might frighten the turtles away. Elsewhere in Florida, beachside lighting on houses and apartments has stopped turtles coming ashore. But Dr. Earhart's work has established that the lights on the shuttle do not put the turtles off. In fact, the Cape is now one of the favoured nesting areas of this threatened species. Her task complete, she heads back to sea. 600 turtles nest on this beach, laying many thousands of eggs. Until recently, most of those eggs didn't even reach hatching stage. The problem is the Space Center's large raccoon population. Raccoons love turtle eggs. At one time, 99% of the loggerhead eggs were being eaten. So today, there's a need to control the raccoons to save the turtle population.
An armadillo has also made a nest in the sand, in the dunes in this case. Her young are just three weeks old. At dawn, the shuttle is still on its five-hour journey to the launch pad. The armadillo family stays underground during the day. Armadillos are mammals, though their scales give them a reptilian look. These are nine-banded armadillos. The bands are part of a protective armor of leathery skin. The belly is soft, and the armadillo pups burrow under it to find milk. The shuttle is nearing the launch pad carried on its giant crawler transporter. As the morning warms up, a gopher tortoise emerges from its burrow. Like tortoises the world over, speed is not its strong point, and it could not outpace the space shuttle for more than a few meters, even at less than two kilometers per hour. Gopher tortoises aren't at all common in Florida. Fortunately, this individual has a head start on the shuttle transporter. The tortoise makes it to safety and the shuttle moves up to the pad. This is the same launch pad from which men went to the moon. Over the next few weeks, the shuttle is prepared for blast-off. Here's an osprey's view of the shuttle as it awaits its launch. The ospreys are nesting on a platform set up for them in a lagoon. This site is usually undisturbed. couldn't be less concerned at the shuttle roaring off into space. Fifty-three kilometers above the osprey nest, when the shuttle has reached a speed of 4,500 kilometers per hour, the two solid rocket boosters are jettisoned. Small rockets are fired to propel the flaming boosters away from the main ship. the 80-ton rocket boosters plummet into the Atlantic. Their fall is broken by the world's strongest parachutes. The rocket boosters are reusable and good for several launches. To collect them, NASA used two special booster recovery ships. At considerable expense, the ships were specially designed with two enclosed propellers which give water jet propulsion at the bow and stern. 
This is to prevent injury to the manatees in the Space Center lagoons. The ships have standard propeller drive to tow the boosters back into Port Canaveral. But when they enter the lagoons, the recovery vessels switch to the enclosed propellers so that the manatees aren't damaged. The manatees float safely in their own underwater world. And above, the astronauts float safely in their world of space. During the different space missions, astronauts have had breathtaking views of the planet. They can spot all sorts of natural phenomena in different parts of the Earth. This is a photograph taken from space of a large forest fire. Another forest fire back on Merritt Island, Florida. This might be a little small for the astronauts to spot, but it's a massive blaze when seen from the ground. Fires are a common occurrence at the Cape. This part of Florida has a very large number of lightning strikes each year. The Fish and Wildlife Service manage fires at the Space Center, setting light to blocks of scrub in rotation. If they didn't do this, the scrub would catch fire naturally and huge areas might blaze out of control and interfere with the shuttle program. So both NASA and the Fish and Wildlife Service prefer a strictly controlled burn. A helicopter drips burning fuel to fire the less accessible areas. Burning is a natural part of the cycle and by no means destructive. It cuts out the dead vegetation, encouraging new growth of pine, palm and palmetto. In front of the stars and stripes, another insect eater, an armadillo. Armadillos are usually nocturnal, but when the nighttime temperature drops below 27 degrees centigrade in the Florida winter, they forage during the day instead. Armadillos hunt along the roadside verges and beside the miles of drainage ditches. They swim across them with confidence. There's a great variety of scaly life in the ditches, including indigo snakes. Despite the fact that the indigo snake may reach two and a half meters in length, it's easily tamed and is a favorite with Florida pet collectors. So many have been captured that the indigo snake is now a threatened species. It's not venomous and moves rather slowly, but it does have powerful jaws. The leopard frog is too wary. The frogs more often fall prey to the Florida soft-shelled turtle. In space above, all is peace. The shuttle cargo bay doors open to reveal the vivid blue shimmer of the Earth below. Atlas commands to internal. 
the 16-meter-long manipulator arm is brought into action. Later in the shuttle program, the arm will be used to load satellites aboard for repair. When exercising in space, the astronauts have to belt themselves down if they're not to hit the ceiling. They circle the Earth at around 27,000 kilometers an hour. That's the space center at Cape Canaveral below. There's a great deal of flying going on there, too. Black vultures and turkey vultures soar effortlessly round the vehicle assembly building in the drafts of air that blow up the faces of this great metal mountain. It was while watching turkey vultures at the beginning of this century that the Wright brothers suddenly realized how to stabilize an aircraft. They noticed that when a vulture is blown by a gust of wind, it stabilizes itself by twisting its wingtips. They copied the Vulture's design and then incorporated it into the aircraft, which made the first ever successful powered flight at Kitty Hawk in 1903. This led the way to all aircraft development and thence to the exploration of space. There are about 800 vultures at the space center. That's a large population for a place of this size. So what is it that attracts them here? Thirteen thousand workers drive in and out of the space center every day. There are 160 kilometers of highways altogether and the same amount of mown grass verge on either side. These verges attract wildlife perilously close to the traffic. Inevitably, there are many road casualties every day from birds to raccoons and armadillos. The vultures glide down from the VAB to clear up the corpses. great blue heron arrives on foot, but the mass of vultures is rather intimidating. There are both turkey vultures with pink heads and black vultures. 
It's the black vultures that sound like dogs barking. As a black vulture provokes a turkey vulture, feathers fly. These birds have found their own niche in this city of giant gantries and buildings that is the heart of the space shuttle program. NASA's space shuttle can launch weather and communication satellites too. A weather satellite can provide advance warning of hurricanes. Hurricanes do sometimes hit the space center, but right now a NASA weather tower records more favorable conditions, just a mild breeze from the east. What the instruments probably do not record, however, is the presence of a bulky osprey nest on top of it. Ospreys catch their fish by stooping from up to 30 meters. It gets rid of the salt water from its body with a characteristic flick and short shake of its feathers. Ospreys are another threatened species, but a substantial number nest in the sanctuary of the space center. Altogether, 14 threatened and endangered species are protected by the spaceport. No other reserve on mainland USA guards as many. On this basis, Merritt Island is possibly the single most important wildlife refuge in North America. The rare woodstalk has done particularly well. Many woodstalk colonies in Florida are blown out by hurricanes, but this one is sheltered. Tiny islands in the lagoons around the space center provide safe nesting sites for many species to raise their young, including great egrets. The downy young egrets are fed on regurgitated fish. They're just a week old, and it'll be a long time before they can fly. When they're older, the chicks are so voracious, it's a wonder that the parents don't lose an eye. In the days before conservation, adult great egrets were shot for their plumes, which often left the youngsters to starve to death. By 1910, the great egret was a rarity in the States. Since then, the combination of public opinion against the use of their feathers for fashion and pressure from conservationists has ensured its very successful return.
As the wood stalks glide down to land in their colonies at the space center, 3,000 kilometers away at Edwards Air Force Base in California, the shuttle orbiter arrives back from space, a rather ungainly bird on its small stubby wings. As it's a glider now, there's no second chance at landing. With touchdown on the dusty lake bed, the mission is complete. Later, the orbiter will be returned to the Kennedy Space Center for another launch into space. Sunset at the launch pads back at the Space Center. Another shuttle mission is imminent. On the beaches, hundreds of newly hatched loggerhead turtles struggle up out of their nests and across the sand towards the surf. They make their way as best they can, hoping to escape the ghost crabs. As many as a quarter of a million young turtles hurry down to the sea each year from the space center. It is entirely as a result of NASA's care and concern, linked with the work of the Fish and Wildlife Service, that the loggerheads, and indeed all the wildlife species, survive so successfully here. Even at dawn, there are still stragglers heading for the Atlantic surf. These youngsters will swim way out into the ocean. Only at around 15 years of age will the females be ready to lay their eggs. So it will be well into the next century before this generation comes back again. What will life be like then? Will we have invented a new space technology to replace rockets? Will people be living in space? Will we have discovered life on another planet? More importantly, how much of our world and its wildlife will be left? No one can say. One thing is sure, as long as NASA and the Fish and Wildlife Service stay in partnership, where humans reach for the stars, there will still be a unique, if unexpected, space for wildlife.